Welcome again. This is uh, Luke chapter 9 we're going to be reading in this session. We're going to be talking about how Jesus sends out the 12. Jesus feeds the 5,000. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus predicts his death. The transfiguration, one of my favorite stories. Jesus heals a demon-possessed boy. Jesus predicts his death a second time. A Samar- the Samaritan opposition the cost of following Jesus. This is going to be a really good chapter. Let's begin with verse 1. He called the 12 together. And in the uh, TR, the Textus Receptus, um, as in the King James, says his, his 12 disciples instead of just simply the 12. So he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them out to preach God's kingdom. That means how God can rule and reign in your life. That is by through repentance, repenting of your sins so that you don't live according to your lust and according to your ways, but you live according to God's rules and laws and guidelines for your life. That's God's kingdom. To preach God's kingdom and to heal the sick. He said to them, take nothing for your journey. Why would he say take nothing for your journey? Well, you see back in those days, you know, if you're going out to preach, uh, what you would do is uh, you would go from house to house. Let's say if you're going to, you know, city A, you know, you'd, you'd find somebody, a really good place to stay there, a really good home to stay at. And while you're staring, staying there, they would, of course, they're not only, you know, lodging you, but they're also feeding you as well. So you would basically work for them. So you wouldn't really need to take anything with you. So Jesus said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staves, nor wallet, nor bread, nor money. Don't have two coats each into whatever house you enter, stay there and depart and depart from there. As many as don't receive you when, they, when you depart from that city, shake off the dust from your feet as a te- for a testimony against them. So Jesus really, especially verse 3 here, um, his point was, you don't need to take money, you don't need to take food, you don't need to take anything, even extra clothes, because you are going to work for what you're getting. Okay, so he's promoting work here. Uh, Basically, it's like capitalism here, okay? So verse 4, he says, whatever house you enter, stay there and depart from there. Uh, Again, verse 5, he's basically, if they don't receive you, then they are very, very unworthy people. Uh, Shake off even the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. Can can you imagine um, having someone uh, so disgusted at the lack of reception that that they even just wipe the dust off their feet as they leave? Because they don't even want the dust. Even the dust from that place is not worthy to be left on your feet. Verse 6. They departed and went throughout the villages. Okay, so they did exactly what Jesus said. Preaching the good news. Preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now, Herod the Tetrarch. Again, Tetrarch would be a ruler, is one of four rulers. Okay. Uh, So Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him. That would be by Jesus. And he was very perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead. Okay, Because you know that Herod had uh, killed John. So that's the reason why he was very perplexed. He thought, this has got to be John raised from the dead. Now, again, why would Herod believe that Jesus is John? Perhaps they looked alike. But more importantly... They preached alike. You know, John, his message was repent. You know, you sin. You know, we were, I was just talking just a little bit earlier here about the sin of gossip and slander and lying. You sin, you repent. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message of John. And so I believe uh, since Herod thought that Jesus was John, he must have either looked like him and or preached like him. So we know that throughout the other Gospels, and and, uh, even I believe in in Luke as well, that Jesus preached much about repentance. That was his first message. Repent. And so Herod's like, wait, they are alike. 
in that sense that they're they're not really part of the you know they're not like the high priest or anything like that they're just this kind of like a street preacher that's going out and preaching repent so they're they're alike in that matter but this time Jesus was doing many miracles which John actually didn't do so probably Herod probably thought wow you know when John rose from the dead he got extra power and now he's doing miracles as well as preaching So let me read this again, verse 7. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him, and he was very perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. Now, again, uh, here we go. It's not just Herod believing that, that Jesus was John. But we got, it says some, meaning other, like some people. Some people believed he was John, risen from the dead. Why would they believe that? Again, the same reason. Maybe he looked like him. Maybe he talked like him. Of course, he preached like him. It's the same message. It's the same word of God, okay? And said, some said that Elijah had appeared. Why would they say that, that Jesus was Elijah? Well, you know, you read in the book of Malachi, or Malachi, that uh, Elijah will come. And, you know, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. That's the spirit of Elijah. And so he was, Elijah, the spirit of Elijah was the spirit of turning, especially the, uh, uh, between a father and his child, the father and his children. That's the spirit of Elijah. And so the turning again is talking about repentance. Okay. Repentance is turning Okay, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, turning the hearts of the children to the fathers. That is repentance. So Jesus preached a message of repentance. That's very clear. And by others, others said that he was one of the old prophets that had risen again. Now, if Jesus came to preach a new gospel, a new message, you know, in the New Testament, why would they think, why would people think that he was one of the old prophets risen again? Like Isaiah, like Hosea, Hosea, um, like Jeremiah. Why would they think that? Because Jesus preached the same message. It's the same eternal, forever <laughs> word of God. The word of God that's forever settled in heaven. Since before the world was created, Till after it is finished. There's a lot of proof here, my friends, that Jesus did not preach anything new. In the New Testament, it's just like how Jesus said, I give you a new command that you love one another. It's really not new. It's more like refreshed. Brand, like, it's like, it's not brand new. It's, it's kind of like renewed or refreshed, Okay. Like when Jesus said to his disciples, I give you a new command that you love one another. Everybody knows that's not a new command. That's in way back in the books of Moses. But he, what he was saying is he, he's refreshing it. Okay, So the Greek word that's used for New Testament and new command is not naos, which means new in the English. Word, in the, in the English. It, it, it's actually from another Greek word, which means you know, like renewed or refreshed, like fresh in that sense but not necessarily new chronologically, okay? Verse 9, Herod said, I beheaded John, but who is this about whom I hear such things? He sought to see him. The apostles, when they had returned, told him what things they had done. He took them and, and with, withdrew apart to a desert region of Bethsaida. Now, uh, the NU, it says here, um, the NU manuscripts does not say a desert re region of, rather just a city called Bethsaida. But the multitudes perceiving it followed him. He welcomed them, spoke to them of God's kingdom, and cured those who needed healing. Now, how would he speak of God's kingdom? Again, he preached the Torah. He preached the message of old. Nothing new here. Nobody says here, oh, wow, this is a completely new, like, um, you know, this is against the Torah. No, no one said that. No one said that at all. 
He preached of God's kingdom, which was obviously from the books of Moses, from the Psalms, from the, prophet, the, the old prophets. And he cured those who needed healing. Again, if you look in the, in the old uh, historical books of what they call the Old Testament, we see a lot of healing as well. Nothing new here, my friends. Verse 12, the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding villages and farms and lodge and get food, for we are here in a deserted place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. Now, that reminds me of Moses and the children of Israel cornered on, the, like, backed up against the Red Sea, and the army of Pharaoh is right there pressing in. Uh, against them. And they're, and Moses is like, oh, God cried out to God. And God said, why do you cry to me? You stretch out your hand and you divide the sea. Yeah, that's what he said. Here, it's just kind of like the same thing. It's like, it's like Jesus said to his disciples, more like, why, why are you saying to send them away? You give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than just five loaves and two fish. <laughs> unless, we, unless we shall go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Now, you got to realize as well that in, biblically speaking, they always counted the men only. No, not always, but almost always counted men only. So it is insinuated here. It is assumed that there were women and possibly children here as well. But only the men were counted. So probably a lot more than 5,000. Um, he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of about, of about 50 each. So uh, get them in order. Get them in order. So that would have been about 100 groups of 50 each. Wow. Of men, that is. Only the men. Okay. It, probably, it might have been a whole lot more, again, considering the women and children. They did so and made them all sit down. He took the five loaves. You imagine one loaf of bread. Now, a loaf of bread back in those days wasn't as big as a loaf of bread what, what we buy today in the store. It was more like just a flat piece of a flat, like a, probably a, a circle kind of a, a flat bread, okay? Almost like a, a pita bread or, you know, as in the Jewish uh, world would be in a matzah bread, you know, or, or um, um, you know, other cultures have got other kinds of flat bread, but more like just like flat bread, just one little piece of flat bread. Okay, per thousand per thousand uh, men, not including women and children too. So he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to up to the sky, he blessed them, broke them, and gave gave to the disciples to set before the multitude. I often wonder again: Is did Jesus say the traditional uh, Jewish blessing? You got to remember, Jesus was a Jew. All these people were Jews. Jesus was a rabbi. You know, could he have said like Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'alam? You know, the the same uh, blessing that Jews say over the uh, food today. Well, maybe very similar to that. Verse seventeen: They ate and were all filled. They gathered up twelve baskets of broken pieces that were left over. Now there is a miracle. Verse eighteen: As he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the multitudes say that I am? They said, John the baptizer. Others say, Elijah. And others, that one of the old prophets had risen again. And he said to them, But, but who do you say that I am? Peter said, The Christ of God. The Mashiach. The Messiah of God. Okay? Christ means Messiah, or in the Hebrew, Mashiach. Peter, if you always, if you notice, he was always the first one to speak up. He was the first one to speak up in the book of Acts. He's the first one to speak up in the Mount, Mount of Tra uh, Transfiguration. He's the first one to run to the tomb. He's the first one to walk on, on water. He was like, he was right there, right there. He was, he was right there, you know. Um, verse 21. But he, Jesus, warned them and commanded them to tell this to no one saying the Son of Man must first must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised up. And he said, he said to all, okay, now he's not just talking to his disciples, 
So now he's going and he's talking to all the multitude. You always got to remember when you're reading the scriptures, who wrote it, who's speaking, who's the audience? A lot of people claim things that Jesus never meant to be spoken directly to them. Okay, Jesus spoke to the 12 disciples and a lot of people that don't even know Jesus at all claim it. Sometimes Jesus is talking to the sinners. Like when he said, don't judge or else you'll be judged because the same things that you judge are the, are the things that you are doing. He wasn't talking to his disciples because he said, you're hypocrites. He's not calling his disciples hypocrites. He's calling the sinners hypocrites, okay? So you always gotta, you always gotta see the context. You always gotta look at the context. Who wrote what you're write, reading? Who's speaking in the, in, 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 the, um, in the writing? Who's the audience? What's said? What is not said? You know, what's the context? What's the cultural context? There's lots of things to consider here. Verse 20, 23, now it says, he said to all, okay? If anyone desires to come after me, there's a lot of people now that desire to come after Jesus. There's a lot of people, you know, old, young, you know, of all different cultures and all different places of the earth. That all, they all say that they, that they believe in Jesus. They all say that they come to Jesus in prayer. They all say that they're Christians. But Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Oh. Deny himself. He didn't say, if anyone desires to come after me, I'll give you your best life now. He didn't say, if anyone desires to come after me, I'll just bless you. He didn't say, and if any, if any of you desire to come after me, I'll give you, you know, a high paying job and yada, yada, yada. He didn't say, if anyone desires to come after me, I'll give you freedom to do whatever you want. Not. Not. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. The, the TR and the NU, the manuscripts, add daily and follow me. Do you realize how powerful this is. Back in those days, the cross wasn't just some, I guarantee you, back in those days, the cross was not some ornament worn around someone's neck and some kind of cool little necklace or cool little thing that you know you have on your, uh, tattooed on your body. The cross was an instrument of death. The cross was an instrument of execution. It was the form of execution in those days. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, and I guarantee you, almost everyone says they desire to go after Jesus, but they don't listen to him. Foolish, foolish they are. If anyone desires to come after me, he says, let him deny himself, take up his cross. That's talking about looking to death, okay? That's talking about dying. And follow me. Verse 24, look at verse 24 there. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose his life for my sake will save it. God, God and Jesus, God demands all. He requires death. Now, I'm not talking about literally, you know, just biological death here. I'm talking about death to self. All of your selfish lusts, ambitions, plans, crucified, sacrificed. Complete and utter self-denial. Whoever saves his life will lose it. Whoever will lose his life for my sake will save it. Verse 25, for what, pro what does it profit a man? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his own self? In many other translations, I like to put it this way. What does it profit a man if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? Really, think about it. What gain does, does it have? Where, where do you put your value? Where do you put your value? 
What profit will you get if you get the whole world and you lose your own soul? Verse 26, For whoever will be ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed. Son of Man speaking of himself, of course. When he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you the truth. There are some of those who stand here who will in no way taste death until they see God's kingdom. What is he talking about? Well, the answer is in the verses that follow. There's no, again, let me read this again. I tell you the truth, verse 27. I tell you the truth. There are some of those who stand here who will in no way taste death until they see God's kingdom. Verse 28. About eight days after these sayings, he took Peter, he took with him Peter, John, and James. Now, again, I say this a lot, but I need to say it again because some of you might not be, this might be your first time listening, okay? But, Peter, John, and James were the ones who were the closest to Jesus. And out of the three, John was the closest. But Peter, John, and James, they were the inner circle. They, were the, they, had the inner, uh, they had the inside scoop. They had the inside story, okay? The rest of the disciples did not, okay? So when you're reading the writings of Peter, James, and John, you will notice a common thread. You will notice they talk a lot about holiness, living right, repentance. The other nine disciples, their writings has got a different, a different tone to them. And, and, you know, reasonably so, because they did not go and see all the different things that Peter, James, and John did. They didn't, they didn't see, they didn't witness, they didn't learn the same things that Peter, James, and John did. Okay. So again, when you're reading something that you're that you know when you're reading the Bible, you got to ask who wrote this. Okay, makes a big difference. You got the twelve disciples, which were the obviously the disciples of Jesus, the ones who were close to Jesus. But out of those twelve, there were three that were the really that were really close to Jesus that knew a lot more than the other nine. But out of those three, there was one that was close to Jesus, John, that even knew more than anything, more than anybody. But then you got outside of the 12, you got Paul. Uh, and again, you read the writings of Paul, you got a completely different song uh, being sung, okay? A different tone, a different, it's a different person. And so you got to take it with a grain of salt, okay? First of all, read the, the words in red. Second of all, read, the, read and understand, memorize, study the writings of Peter, John, and James. After that's done, study the rest of the, 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 uh, the writings of the other 12 disciples, or excuse me, the other nine. And after that's done, Paul's writings should be the last that you read and study because you gotta, you gotta keep it in context. You gotta know what you're reading and who wrote it. So he took Peter, John, and James with him up to the mountain to pray. Verse 29, as he was praying that... Uh, the appearance of his face was altered. His clothing became white and dazzling. Behold, two men were talking with him. Like two men appeared who were Moses and Elijah. Hebrew names, Moshe and Eliyahu. Who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. Literally, it says here, Exodus. Which, was about, which, uh, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Verse 32, Now Peter and those who were with him were, were heavy with sleep. But when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. As they were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's good for us to be here. You see, in the, you see the glory of God. You see the Son of Man, the Son of God in all of His glory with Moses and Elijah. Wow. <laughs> wow, yes, it's good for you to be here. Uh, let's make three tents. Yeah, let, let's make three tents so we can all just live up here. 
One for you, Mo, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Verse 34. While he said these things, a crowd came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered into the cloud. A voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. When the voice came, Jesus was found alone. They were silent, and they told no one in those days of anything, of, of, of any of the things, or any of the things which they had seen. Now, let me just go, if, again, if you were to read the writings, the letters of Peter, you will read, Peter does mention this experience in his writings. He said, you know, we did not follow cunningly devised fables, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And, you know, he talks about the whole thing about um, hearing the, the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son. And the you know experiencing the glory of God, experiencing the glory up on the mountain. He he talks about that in his writing. Verse thirty seven. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, so they stayed up there for a whole day. Uh, a great multitude met him. Behold, a man from the crowd called out and said, "Teacher," you know, literally that would be Rabbi. I beg you to to look at my son, for he is my only child. Behold, a spirit takes him, and he, he suddenly cries out, and it convulses him so that he foams, and it hardly departs from him, bruising him severely. I begged your disciples to cast it out, and they couldn't. Jesus answered, Faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. When he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him violently. But Jesus rebuked the, the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. They were all astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were marvel, while all were marveling at, at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men. Of course, talking about his death. But they didn't understand the saying. It was concealed from them that they should not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Hmm. Verse 46. An argument arose among them about which of them was the greatest. Again, you know, I mean, we got this. We see this in a lot of churches today. We see this even outside of church. We see, we see this in different Christian fellowships. Who's the greatest? You know, who's going to be the pastor? Who's going to be the bishop? Who's going to be the, the pope? You know, who's going to be the, uh, the priest? You know, who's going to be the, the, peace, the priest or pastor's, you know, right-hand man? You know, Who, which, of, which of them is going to be the greatest? It's kind of a good question, you know. Verse 20, uh, 47, excuse me. Jesus perceiving... And reason, the reasoning of their hearts took a little child and set him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For whoever is least among you, among you all, this one will be great. You notice that God is like the great inverter. He takes those who are proud, and he brings them low. He takes them, those who are low, and he brings them high. He takes those who men speak all, men speak well of a certain group or a certain person or a certain club or a certain musician or a certain celebrity. Men speak well of this certain person. God brings that person low. But he takes the ones whom a lot of people speak evil about, and he brings them high, and he sets them up on high. He takes the least and he makes them the greatest. He takes the greatest and he makes them the least. He makes the valleys, he raises the valleys and he brings down the mountains. John answered. By the way, too, another thing too, especially in this culture and a lot of the developed world, he takes what a lot of people calls bad and he says it's good. He takes what a lot of people calls good and God says it's bad. Verse 49, John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he didn't follow us. 
Jesus said to him, Don't forbid him, for he who is not against us is for us. It came to pass when the days were near that he should be taken up, he intently set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. They went and entered into a village of the Samaritans so as to prepare for him. They didn't receive him because he was traveling with his face toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, excuse me, they said, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from the sky and destroy them as Elijah did? Verse 55, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you don't know what kind of spirit of what kind of spirit you are. For the Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. They went to another village. Now, let me just stop here for a second, because you know, when the Son of Man came the first time, he came to save men's lives. But you know, when he comes the second time, it says very clearly, don't confuse the two come, don't confuse the Messiah to come with the Messiah that, that already came, okay? Because, because when Jesus comes back, it says he will destroy so many of the ungodly. It says that very clear. He will tread out the wine press of God's fury and the blood will come up to the horse's bridles. It will be a total mess of blood and war when God, when Jesus comes back. They went to another village, 57. Uh, verse 57, as they went on the way, a certain man said to him, I want to follow you wherever you go, Lord. Jesus said, foxes have holes and the birds of the, the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, allow me first to go bury my father. Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead, but you go and announce God's kingdom. Another also said, I want to follow you, Lord, but first allow me to go say goodbye to those who were at my house. And Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for God's kingdom. Ah. Jesus basically, I mean, you know, some people would say, Oh, you don't have no compassion, you don't have no compassion. I'm sure they would say that to Jesus. Hey, someone came up, you know, an innocent guy comes up, you know, just coming up to him and saying, I want to follow you, Lord. I want to follow you, Jesus, but I, want, I just want to go say goodbye to those whom I love that are back at home. I want to go say goodbye to them. Just let me go say goodbye. Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for God's kingdom. In other words, you're not even fit for God's kingdom. You're not even fit for heaven. Wow, what a powerful and what a very sober warning and word that we get from this. Yes, it's very serious to follow Jesus. Yes, he commands and he demands all, everything, all your life to deny yourself, to take up your cross and follow him, meaning death to you. Death to to all who want to follow him. Again, we're not talking literally about biologically death per se. I mean, it could it could mean that if if someone kills you for you know executes you for the faith or whatever. A lot of people have lost their lives for their belief in Jesus, but it also means you know that you are to die to yourself, to your own lust, to your own wants. Die to what you want and say, Lord, it's not what I want. It's not what makes me feel good. It's what makes you feel good, Lord. It's what you want. Obedience, repentance, loving God. And as Jesus said, if you love him, you will do what he commands. So as you go and you think about these words, be blessed May God give you eyes to hear, or eyes to see, I should say, ears to hear, and open the eyes of your understanding that you would be able to see and understand the riches 
of his word in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Thank you again.